Thanks, thanks, David. Can everybody hear me? Um, I, uh, I, this talk came about because I've always been puzzled reading reviews of books by people like Richard Dawkins, by the people who say, um, oh, well, of course, he doesn't talk, he doesn't discuss the God we believe in. All his criticisms of God are all old-fashioned criticisms of what's sometimes called the God of the Philosopher. And they all, in the tradition of what is called, and you'll eventually learn what this term means if you don't, ontotheological uh, philosophy, which is um, very much derided by the modern theologians. And, and so they've been going around saying things with respect to Richard Dawkins like this, that his theology is superficial, um, that he doesn't really understand what we're talking about. In other words, they're saying, oh, you didn't do it, uh, you missed, um, with your criticisms. Um, and I got curious about just what sort of God uh, these people were believing in, if any sort of God at all. Did it make any sense? Was it something that we would uh, uh, believe in or not believe in? Uh, what were the arguments for it? Where did it fit in the context of theology? Now, I'm a beginner in this field, and I'm not an expert in modern theological theories. Um, and so this, what I'm going to give you tonight, is what I've gleaned from a few months dabbling in some of these areas. Um, Barney Schwartz says, I don't believe in the God that Richard Dawkins doesn't believe in. <laughs> because he doesn't, he believes in a different God. Okay, just as by way of preamble, um, a couple of points I'd like to make at the beginning. There's always been a tension in Christianity between the rational justification of belief and the irrational core of religion. So way back in the uh, second century, we got Tertullian with his famous paradox. Um, just because it is absurd, it is to be believed. Some people who are going to be there might like to change rather than keep going like this. I think that's a good idea. Because it's probably awful for you and distracting. Because <laughs> I move around a bit. I'm a very peripatetic uh, lecturer. Um, yeah, just because it is absurd, it is to be believed. Uh, seek not to understand that you may believe but believe that you may understand. Sometimes attributed it to St. Augustine, but my sources say it was St. Anselm. I always have trouble with that because I always say St. Anselm, which is a bit dyslexic for me. And uh, Aquinas, to one who has faith, no explanation is necessary. To one without faith, no explanation is possible. Human salvation demands the divine disclosure of truths surpassing reason. So religion's always seen as a bit beyond reason or outside the realm of reason. And um, Dawkins and, and et al are only the latest of a whole uh, raft of people over the centuries who are trying to nail them with the, on the cross of irrationalism. Okay, the second preamble point is that the idea of a separate spiritual realm as a mode of existence is relatively new in human terms. Right? Most people have always thought that the, uh, the realm of the gods coexists with the realm of humans in some way. There are actually bridges between us, there are actually places we can go where you will meet the gods. The Greeks, for example, believed that Mount, the gods lived at the top of Mount Olympus, which was the highest mountain in Greece. And they believed that. Hades was actually, the underworld was actually down below, and some of their cre uh, heroes and heroines actually went down to Hades. Ulysses in the Odyssey visits Hades, and Persephone, of course, is, is um, snatched away by Hades. Hades was the name of the place and also the name of the god that lived and taken down to Hades by Hades. Um, quote from Pindar, Greek poet. Of one race, only one, men and gods, both one mother's womb, we draw our breath. 
So he believed that men and gods were of similar stock and the gods were just different because they were more powerful. Um, and similar beliefs have uh, permeated Western culture right too. The Vikings in the late Middle Ages, um, they believed in the, the, uh, the three realms, Asgard, Midgard, and that time. Midgard was where the human beings lived, it meant Middle Earth, and it's of course where Tolkien got his concept of Middle Earth for the, uh, for the Middle Earth trilogy, and the gods lived up in Asgard. And there were bridges and various places, the roots of the three, various places to get from one to the other, but it was all part of the same realm. Um, in the Jewish tradition, there are lots of encounters with God, various stages. Jesus um, was God himself, according to the Christians, and when he uh, is finished with what he had to do on earth, he ascends up to heaven. So the idea was heaven was just up there. Um, I always think it's interesting with all these Americans uh, believing in the rapture at the moment. Well, not just Americans, people all over the world, where they will rise up to heaven. And I imagine, uh, what about the believers in Australia? If they rise up, they'll be going in totally the opposite direction to the ones who are going that way. Um, and Muhammad, there's the story of Muhammad on his fa favourite horse going on a night journey to Jerusalem and then up to heaven. It was all part of the same geography. Um, but then gradually they developed a more sophisticated view that the gods uh, didn't, you know, weren't coexistent with space and time and human beings and so on. The first person probably to develop that idea is Plato with his idea of the forms and the ultimate good, um, the supreme good. So you had this idea that uh, religion or gods existed in a tough place outside time and space where there was no material substance. So eternity doesn't mean forever, it just means no time. And infinite, in, infinity in this context doesn't mean uh, dis, uh, as long, you know, distance it never ends, but it means outside space altogether. Now the third comment I'm going to make at the beginning is that in actual fact, the majority of believers believe in a version of the traditional view um, most of the terrorists that blow themselves up in railway stations believe that they actually go to a real place called heaven, which is uh, exists in space and time where there'll be real people looking after their every needs. According to one theory I've read where it says they'll be looked after by a number of virgins, it's actually a mistranslation of an old Syrian word. The word was actually raisins, they'll get lots of raisins. <laughs> which, if true, will be quite a shock to a lot of them. Um, Paul Davies, I had a conversation with Paul once and he made the point that the biggest gap in sophisticated belief is not between the atheists and the sophisticated believers who uh, would have a very similar view of what the way the world is with the, just the extra example of the people who believe in God say, yeah, oh yes, and there's a God. But the, the big gap is between the sophisticated believers and the majority of believers who believe most of this stuff, literally. So in other words, most people probably do believe in God that Richard Dawkins doesn't believe in. Okay, now we get to uh, the nitty gritty. What, um, what happened uh, to religion was that, uh, was basically, was, was the Enlightenment. Um, the Enlightenment came along, uh, some great thinkers like Voltaire, like David Hume, like Immanuel Kant, came along and thoroughly analysed religion. Um, and I'm not going to rehearse here all the arguments they put through it, because most of you are probably aware of uh, the ideas of the Enlightenment. But the upshot of it was that traditional religious beliefs no longer seem to be intellectually respectable, because um, they were shown from various points of view not to be tenable. So, religion uh, could have just packed up its bags and gone away, but it decided to fight back. Um, there was a religious reaction to the Enlightenment. Um, and that took a number of different uh, 
paths. Uh, but basically they all involve the rejection of reason as a tool for uh, analysing religion and as a, just a way of justifying religion. So they tried to uh, sidestep the, the reasoned approach of the, the Enlightenment thinkers by rejecting reason altogether. So, at the turn of the uh, 18th century, you had Schleiermacher, who argued that religion wasn't about reason, but about emotion. Man feels the world religiously. So, it's all about the religious feeling that we all have, and this justified religion. We had Kierkegaard, um, who we were talking about the existentialism before, the Kierkegaard generally acknowledged as the, the first existentialist, he was the first person to put human existence and, and human individual existence at the centre of philosophy. And, and Kierkegaard said that we had to accept the paradox that rationality couldn't provide us with a justification of religion. Instead, we had to go inwards and we had to take what he called the leap of faith. A previous philosopher, who now talked about the huge chasm that existed between religion and reason. And Kierkegaard said, by the use of faith, you can leap over that chasm. That's where the idea of the leap came from. Um, Kierkegaard went into his own uh, mind, into his own um, thoughts, to try and understand the basis of religion, which was not, in fact, a very good move, because what he found there, of course, was all the things that his Lutheran upbringing had told him. So when he did this rigorous sort of um, analysis of what his own mind told him, what my mind told him, the basics of the Lutheran philosophy of Denmark at the time. 